Good evening, everyone, those in church, and uh, to our online viewers. I believe the day has been good. The Lord has kept you safe. We want to thank him, even as we join together in the midweek prayers, that the Lord may speak to us one more time. I welcome our online viewers especially and pray that you will be blessed as well. Let us pray. Our Father, what in heaven and dwells in our hearts, we thank you, we glorify your name, we give you honor because you are worthy of our praises. We thank you for taking care of us throughout the day and allowing us to assemble here to worship you in songs and to hear you speak to us one more time. I pray for your blessings. I pray for the Holy Spirit to take us through this program to the end. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, we will start with the hymn session. We praise our God through songs before we welcome the speaker of the hour. I will start with hymn number 604, We Know Not the Hour. We know not the hour. We know not the hour of the master's appearing. Yet signs all foretell that the moment is nearing. When he shall return, tis a promise most cheering, but we know not the hour. He will come. Let us watch and be ready. He will come. Hallelujah, hallelujah. He will come in the clouds of his Father's bright glory, but we know not the arm. There's light for the wise who are seeking salvation. There's truth in the of the Lord's revelation. Each prophecy points to the great consummation, but we know not the hour. He will come. Let us watch and be ready. He will come, hallelujah, hallelujah. He will come in the clouds of his Father's bright glory, but we know not the arm. We'll watch and we'll pray with the light streamed and burning. We'll walk and we'll wait till the master's returning. We'll sing and rejoice every omen discerning, but we know not the hour. He will come us watch and be ready. He will come. Hallelujah, hallelujah. He will come in the clouds of his Father's bright glory, but we know not the It's a call for us to be ready, even as we wait for the master's soon return. We will do hymn number 318 in our SDA hymnals, 318. I continue to welcome you, dear viewer, wherever you are. Feel blessed together with those of us who are here in church. 318, 
whiter than snow. Lord Jesus, I long to be perfectly whole. Let's go. Lord Jesus, I long to be perfectly whole. I want thee forever to live in my soul. Break down every idol, cast out every foe. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Whiter than snow, yes, whiter than snow. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Lord Jesus, look down from thy throne in the skies and help me to make a complete sacrifice. I give up myself and whatever I know. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Whiter than snow, yes, whiter than snow. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Lord Jesus, for this I most humbly entreat. I wait patiently at thy crucified feet. By faith for my cleansing, I see thy blood flow. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Whiter than snow, yes, whiter than snow. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, thou seest I patiently wait. Come now and within me a new heart create. To those who have sought thee, thou never saidst no. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Whiter than snow, yes, whiter than snow. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Whiter than snow, yes, whiter than snow. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Amen. I believe it's everyone's prayer that the Lord may wash us whiter than snow. We will do hymn number 302, Deeper Yet in His Blood. In the blood from the cross I have been made from sin but to be Free from draws, still I would enter in. Deeper yet, deeper yet, into the crimson flood. Deeper yet, deeper yet, under the precious blood. Day by day, all by all, blessings are sent to me, but for more of his power, ever my prayer shall be, deeper yet, deeper yet, into the green. Christ, I would live following him each day. What I ask, he will give. So then with faith I pray. Deeper yet, deeper yet, I 
into the great sun blood. Deeper yet, deeper yet, under the precious blood. Now I have peace, sweet peace, while in this world of sin. But to pray. I will do one more hymn, then the last one that was requested by our speaker. The last hymn, um, if I do the theme song of the hour, is hymn number 441 in our SDA hymnals, 441. I saw one weary, sad and torn With eager steps pressed on the way Who long the hallowed cross had borne Still looking for the promised day While many a line of grief and care Upon his brow was furrowed there I asked what point his spirits up, or this said he the blessed hope. And one I saw with sword and shield, who boldly, bravely was crowned frown, and fought unyielding on the field to win an everlasting crown. I asked what point his spirits up all this said he the blessed hope and there was one who left behind the cherished friends of earthly years and honor pleasure wealth resigned to tread the path the Dewed with tears, though trials deep and conflict so yet still a smile of joy he wore. I asked what buoyed his spirits up, or oh, this said he the blessed hope. While pilgrims he we journey on in this dark veil of sin and gloom through tribulation, hate and scorn, or through the portals of the tomb, till our returning King shall come to take his Exile captives home. Oh, what can boy the spirits up? Tis this alone the blessed hope. God bless you. I will now do the last hymn in our SDA hymnals. Hymn number 83, 83, which will be in line with the, the message from God this evening. Oh, worship the King. Oh, worship the King. Oh, 
Sorry, sorry. Oh, worship the King, all glorious above. Oh, gratefully sing His wonderful love. A shield and defender, the ancient of days, pavilion in splendor, and guarded with praise. Oh, tell of His might, oh, sing Whose robe is the light, whose canopy is peace, his chariots of wrath, the deep thundering from, and dark is his path on the wings of the storm. Thy bountiful care, what tongue can recite? It breathes in the Streams from the hills, it descends to the plain, and sweetly distills it the dew and the rain. Frail children of dust and feeble and frail, in thee do we trust, nor find thee to fail. Thy mercies, how tender! Farm to the end. Amen. Defender, redeemer, and friend. God bless you so much. It's time um, that we want to hear the Lord speak to us. Sorry, I never introduced myself. My name is Dorcas Omondi. Um, it's been my pleasure to serve the Lord this evening in songs. And the man servant of the Lord whom he chose to speak to us this evening is none other than Elder Gordon Omondi. And I pray that the Lord may use him mightily. Elder, you're welcome. And before that, let's have a word of prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for giving us this privilege and opportunity to praise you in songs. I pray that you may accept our worship this evening as your manservant stands up to speak. May you be known, may you be seen, may you be heard through him. Use him to speak a message of hope and comfort to the dying hearts of your children. May you be with us till the end in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. We want to thank the Lord for the privilege that he has given us to meet here this evening and share his word. Throughout this week, we will be looking at the theme of worship the Lord in gladness. So the Nairobi East Choral will have the privilege this week of sharing with you about the art of worshiping the, Lord, worshiping the Lord with gladness. And I am glad to be the curtain raiser for this series that uh, you will have this evening. You will have it again on Friday during the Vespers time and on Sabbath as we join together. I want to take this privilege to invite all of you to our music Sabbath that is uh, just three days ahead of us. Um, the theme, Worship the Lord with Gladness, is our focus. And this evening, I just want to spend a short time to share with you a bit of my experience in the worship but also look at why and how we can worship the Lord with gladness. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, 
As we open your word, we pray that you may speak to us in a voice that we cannot mistake for another one. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. Our key text will be from the book of Psalms. I will read Psalms chapter 100. Uh, my focus is on verse 2, but it's a very short psalm, so we can read all of it to get the gist of uh, the matter that David is bringing to our attention. So it says from the New Living Translation, Shout with joy to the Lord all the earth. Verse 2, Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him singing with joy. Verse 3, Acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Verse 4. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. Verse 5. For the Lord is good. His unfailing love continues forever. And his faithfulness continues to each generation. This Psalm 100 basically summarizes what we need to do and why we need to do it. This Psalm of David is calling upon each one of us as Christians to come before God and worship him with gladness and with joy. Let me try to portray a picture. You know, in heaven, God has a set of angels. They are called the cherubims and the seraphims. The cherubims are the ones who sit around the throne of God. They face the seat of mercy. And as they look at Jesus Christ, him crucified, they sing with joy. And their song is holy, holy, holy. From everlasting to everlasting, their message their song is about the holiness of God. They sing holy to God the Father, holy to God the Son, holy to God the Holy Spirit. Holy, holy, holy is their song. One musician says, holy, holy, holy is what the angels sing. But when we get to heaven, we will bring another song. It is called the song of Moses and the Lamb. Why Moses and the Lamb? Because Moses and the act of being used by God to deliver the children of Israel from bondage of Egypt to Canaan was a shadow of the sacrifice that Jesus would, would give on Calvary as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so Moses had an experience, a glimpse of the experience that those who will be saved at the end of time will have. And when we get to heaven, having gone through the tribulations and seen the mercy of God, having lived at a time when God's mercy will not be shown to anyone, when we get saved finally, we will have a song of experience. You know, the angels that do not need to be saved, they have never sinned. So they cannot have the experience of a savior and a person who has been saved out of the blood of Christ. And when we see Christ in heaven, we will remove our crowns, place them at his feet and say, worthy, worthy is the lamb that was slain. Worthy, worthy is the lamb. 
And as we sing the song of worthy, worthy is the Lamb, a people who have been redeemed from the tribulations of this world, from the troubles of sin, from diseases and maladies, from death and suffering, the angels will stand out looking at us, wondering who these people are and what nature of song they are giving. Worship the Lord with gladness. Brethren, I am saying we don't have to wait to get to heaven to praise the Lord. We read from the book of Psalms, chapter 1, two, verse 1, the experience of David. David says that he was glad when he was asked to go to the house of the Lord. He was glad. In Psalms 100, verse 2 that we have read, you see, he's saying, worship the Lord with gladness. Why? In verse 3, because the Lord is good. The Lord is loving and caring. And so, in the book of Psalms 100 verse 2, David is calling upon us, and I am extending that call this evening, that we may come to the Lord to worship him with gladness. I have had the privilege sometimes of being a chorister. But I have also had the privilege of speaking to a congregation like this one today. And when you observe the congregation during singing and during sermons, you will see a number of Christians, a number of church members who sit with disinterest. You look at their faces, they look so bored. Others, when you look at our attendance of service, make a lot of struggle to come to church and fellowship with brethren. But you see by the appearance of their faces that they may not be enjoying or they are receiving very little benefits from the attendance of the service. This can be a casual observation that anyone who stands here may see, but also visitors feel the warmth and also the coldness of a church that they attend. So the question I wanted to us to address this evening is how, how do we make each other to know the Lord and to find joy in worshiping the Lord, to find joy and encouragement in the assembly of brethren? How can we make each other more and more close so that we look forward to the next coming service. But the basic question that we must ask ourselves, what is worship? So three things that I want to say about worship this evening. Number one, worship is action. Worship is action. We act when we worship. What do we act? We show reverence and we show adoration towards God. You know, like they say love is a verb, it's a doing word. So is worship. Worship is an action of showing how much we love God and also showing how much we revere him. You know, when we talk about fearing the Lord, showing the Lord reverence, it is how you handle yourself in the presence of the Lord. You would, farm, you would most of the time hear the elders say, please keep quiet in the house of the Lord. Don't walk in the house of the Lord. You are more often reminded to put on off our telephone, our mobile phones as we come into the presence of the Lord. Are our actions showing reverence? But number two, worship is not just something that we do when we meet on Sabbath. Worship is also a way of life. I remember one time when I was preparing for child education service, I read that uh, 
even the act of washing babies should reflect worship. See, when mothers cuddle their babies and bathe them, they must start telling the babies at the young at the younger age that they are that it is the blood of Christ that washes away our sins. You know, when you give your child food, pray and always remember, remind him or her that it is Jesus Christ who is the bread of life. Ellen White says that um, before God could take Enoch to heaven, Enoch was so reverent that even when he was walking, he was worshipping God. Everything that he was doing was a breath of worship. God so loved Enoch and his presence that he would come to visit Enoch until one day Enoch told him, you have been visiting me, we have been friends for a while. I also want to visit you. And you know God told Enoch that where I live, when you visit me, you cannot come back here. And Enoch insisted on visiting God. So one day, people went to sleep. And when they woke up, Enoch was no more. Because God had taken him. It was because Enoch lived and breathed worship and reverence. And we will learn that when we learn to revere the Lord and to worship him with gladness, even our spiritual life changes and grows. But number three... Worship takes different forms. And I think that is the emphasis of the second text, uh, point that I have made. That uh, we can worship the Lord through singing. We can worship the Lord through praying. We can worship the Lord through reading of scripture and Bible study. We can worship the Lord through our tithes and offerings. But we can also worship the Lord by serving others. And that is why this church has got several ministries whose orientation and whose foundation and aim, whose objective is to reach the world through service and through sharing of the love of God. Why should we worship the Lord with gladness? In order to worship the Lord with gladness, we must first of all understand who God is. The God whom we serve is a loving and a gracious God. You see, before we have a need for him, he extends his hands of love to us so that he may reach us and lift us up. But it is not just because of his love and grace, but also because of his holiness. The Lord whom we serve is a holy God, and because of this holiness, because of his grace, and because of his loving kindness, he deserves our worship and praise. This act of worship and praise is not willing to share with any individual, any object, or any principle. He deserves our worship. Why? Because he is the one who created us, he is the one who redeemed us and is the one who sustains our lives and the entire universe. No one else has got that authority. And therefore, worshiping God with gladness helps us to focus on God throughout our entire life with faithfulness even in difficult times. There are times that our, in our human nature, we may not feel like worshipping God. Like serving God with gladness. You know, when you are taking care of a terminally ill member of the family, how can you worship the Lord with gladness and joy? When you have no food to eat and you have children who are looking forward to you to provide, how can you worship the Lord in truth and gladness? When you yourself is bombarded with trials and temptations that look like they are weighing you down. How can you worship the Lord with goodness, in gladness and joy? You can only do that when you understand the nature of God and who he is. You know, the Bible is full of encouragement of people like us whom the Lord delivered 
at times of their need. I remember the widow of Zarephath. She had got only one meal for herself and her son. You know, she was preparing the last supper that they would take as a family and go into the starvation of death, not because they want to fast, but because there is no food. It is at that moment that God sends Elijah. And through Elijah, the jar of oil did not increase, the jar of oil did not reduce. For three and a half years, there was always enough for the next meal. And they ate and they ate until the session of famine was over. I am trying to imagine that the widow of Seraphath lived in a village like we are living today. Maybe she lived in an estate like we are doing today. But from the story, because she was fetching firewood, I would believe that she was in the village. And this son of the widow of Zarephath must have had friends. And as these friends were, continue, were continuing to be famished of famine, they must have asked him, how is it that you are never famished like we are? And he would tell them that in my mother's house, there is bread and there is oil that is always there ever since the prophet of God came. When we understand God, difficult times can never cease, can never make us to cease to worship him in joy and gladness. Yes, I remember Mary and Martha. When they lost their loved ones, and as Jesus comes to Bethany, Mary tells Jesus, Lord, if you were here four days ago, you may have saved our brother. We thank God for the story of Lazarus because through that story, we understand that four days late, God is still on time. Jesus is not limited by the span of time. Your problems, the problems that you face, the temptations that you face, God, when we trust in him, will always make a way out. The needs that we have as families, the needs that we have as individuals, Christ will come in time, just in time, just in time. He will show that he is never late. He is still on time, four days after the death of, Zaraf, of, of Lazarus. I remember Jairus and his daughter. The girl was dead three days. Jesus comes and asks the girl to just wake up. And immediately, the girl rises from her death. We may be dead in sickness. We may be dead in sin. But one day, Christ will visit us. If not in this flesh, but when he comes back again, he will tell each one of us, rise up and go with me. And we will all rise into the newness of time, the newness of life, and we will realize and understand that God is never late. We can worship the Lord in goodness, in gladness, and with joy when we understand who he is. But also not just our experience. We worship God with gladness as a way to express our gratitude and thankfulness for all that he has done for us. I don't know what the Lord has done for you. But let me share with you my experience at the beginning of this year. In the month of December, my firstborn son was admitted in hospital with malaria and very high fever that could not be contained for one whole week, forcing the doctors to take him to the intensive care unit. He stayed there for four days. He was brought back to the general ward. And while at the general ward, my son suffered convulsions from these high temperatures again, causing blood hemorrhage and resulting into stroke that placed him on bed for 23 days. During that 23-day time that he was on bed, he suffered multiple convulsions. Ten days within the 23 days, he was on life support. 
as a family, we were preparing for his funeral. While we were praying and asking God for his life, I was telling his, his younger brother, I remember asking him what he would do if the next day we come to the hostel and we are told that the boy is dead. You know, we would worship the Lord together with my wife. We would sing, we would pray, and we would go to stay with a friend who was hosting us. And while we were alone, we would cry the whole night. Literally crying and asking God for the life of our son. And then 10 days after being on life support, he came out of the intensive care unit and he was brought back to the general ward. But he was brought back to the general ward, he could not walk. And when he started to speak, he was, his, his mind had gone. He could not recognize anyone. He did not know where he was. And he was a psychiatric case. He would shout anything that he wanted to shout. He would ask for anything. He would start remembering the things that he did when he was in primary school. The friends that he had in college. The friends that he had in the estate. He would ask why they have not come to see him. He would say things that they used to say when they were playing as young boys. And the, the neuro, neurologist who was seeing him came to us one morning and said, you know, your son will remain in this condition for a very long time. So I would like to prepare you to start getting used. The minimum it may take is six months. But uh, that is the bare minimum. It can go beyond a year. We do not know how fast he can recover. That same day, like the experience of Job, the physician comes. And he tells us, you know, we are trying to put your son on physiotherapy. Because of the bill, we are preparing him for discharge. But he will leave this place bedridden. So I don't know what amount of budget you have put in place to take care of this young man. The nurse care, have you prepared a wheelchair? Have you organized for an ambulance to take you to Nairobi because you are transferring from Mombasa? And we looked at ourselves. Already the bill had overwhelmed us. There was no other budget that we had. We were just ourselves. And so we decided to pray. Because that was the only hope that we had. The only nurse care that we had as a family was God himself. The only psychiatric specialist who could help our son was God and no one else. And so we prayed and fasted for three days. Brethren, the Lord is faithful. At the end of our three-day fast, our boy started raising up himself from the bed to sit down. When the physiotherapist came, he found the boy had already risen and sat down. The second day, he plugged out the gadget that they were using to, to feed him. And he started feeding on himself, not using the... the the tube that they used to feed. On the third day, he not only rose again from his bed, but he could now rise, and if you hold him, he could walk. And the physiotherapist stopped coming. Because every time he came, he would find that our son John had already been walking. Cut the long story short. Seven days from our first day of fasting, we were ready for discharge. John left the hospital walking, not bedridden, not on a wheelchair, not on a crutch. He was walking on his legs. Not only that, John was fit. His mind was back. His senses were alert. He could listen to music. He could sing the same music. You would ask him who you are. He would tell you, you are so-and-so. He would ask for a friend and he would say, please call for me so-and-so to come and visit me. And that so-and-so would come and they would spend an hour talking and talking sense, not psychiatric issues. And since then, 
John has never gone back to bed bedridden. John has never had any psychiatric case. When we worship God with gladness, it is a way of expressing our gratitude. It is a way of expressing our thankfulness for all that the Lord has done for us. And so David calls us this evening that we may worship the Lord with gladness and with joy. But I would like to say two more things and then we will close. I want to bring your focus to two areas. The first area is the worship of the Lord through regular assembly. In the book of Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 24 and 25, Paul, through his letter to the Hebrews, is admonishing us that we should not be in the behavior of other brethren who fail to come to the gathering and meetings of saints. He is admonishing us that as the coming of Christ nears, we need much more to come together to worship the Lord. For two reasons. One, that we may prepare for his second coming. But secondly, that we may keep one another in salvation. Do you know, one of the primary things that would enable you to see that a brother is backsliding is when they stop attending worship. A story is told of a, a community in old. They used to worship and pray in the forest. So they would leave their homes in the morning and they would walk to the point of worship. And as they did this over a period of time, they realized that from each other's door to the place of worship, there had been created a footpath. Grass had been laid down and dried. And so what they would do, every day as they come to worship and go, they would observe the footpath that came from each other's house. And when they noted that the grass in one path started to rise up, they would know that that brother has started to stop coming from And they would go to the brother and say, brother so and so, we can see that grass is growing on your path. You know, when they said that, the brother would understand that they are saying, we are concerned that you are no longer attending worship service. We attend general worship service so that we may keep each other warm as we serve the Lord and as we keep in waiting for his soon return. The worship assembly creates several opportunities for us in the assembly of brethren is the service of music. We praise the Lord by raising our voices high to sing to him. But also, we share the fellowship of Bible study. We study scripture together so that we may grow. We may not remain babies forever, but that we may grow. But also, we have the service of the Holy Communion. A service where we express our humility by washing each other's feet encouraging each other to be humble, learning to do what Christ did and the call of Christ that we should serve one another and knowing that humility is a fruit that we only receive when the Holy Spirit dwells in us. The apostles met. Every first day of the week, they would meet. They would meet in the night after Sabbath and worship the Lord, sing and study the word of God. During these worship assemblies, we attend Bible classes where each one of us has got an opportunity to learn to know more about what God wants us to be, who God wants us to be, what God wants us to be like as we prepare for his second coming. So how do we get more 
out of these assemblies when we meet. Now, I would like to say that these assemblies are not limited just to the church assembly, but also to the home church assemblies that we have. How do we get more out of this assembly? Number one, prepare, prepare in good time for the worship. Preparation makes the difference. Those who run know that you need to prepare before the race. It is the same with our spiritual race. God wants us to prepare. Sleep early so that you wake up early, fresh to go for the service. And when you go for the service, you go to the service when you are fresh and alert. Preparation beforehand makes a big difference in what we get out of the church when we come for the service. When you read your lesson before coming for the lesson study in church, you gain more out of that study than those who are coming to read for the first time without preparation or those who are coming to listen because you feel challenged, you know. When you hear somebody explain something that you learned, it gets, it sinks into you. It emphasizes to you that your understanding was right. And where you feel your understanding is not right, you can ask a question. The way a person who prepared asks a question is different from the way those who did not prepare ask questions. More often than not, those who do not prepare would ask general questions who are generally out of the study. But they would want to express their understanding of the Bible, not of the lesson under study. When you prepare in good time, even your questions make a difference. So when you prepare in time, you come to church, not just to be served, but also to be able to serve. You know, when you're a chorister, and you prepare very well according to the theme of the day, and you come to lead, your leading of music is different from the chorister who comes when he, only, he or she only has the first song that they are going to sing. And as the people go towards the end of the song, he or she rushes to look for the next song. There is a very big difference. There is coherence when you prepare. There is a, a smooth flow of singing and music when you prepare. But also, music, leading the music through choristering becomes light, easy, and joyful for the one who prepares than for the one who does not. Something else, be mindful of those who are present when you come for the service. People like you who appreciate the presence and the encouragement of other Christians rejoice when you recognize that they are around. You know, when you come and sit down in church, do you bother to greet the person who is next to you? And if you don't know them, do you bother to ask? You know, my first Sabbath day in this church, my first Sabbath day in this church, last year in April, I sat next to a brother. And we had a service. And when the service was over, he turned to me. He told me, brother, I don't know you. You look a visitor to me. You know? So I introduced myself. And indeed, it was my first Sabbath. And he also introduced himself. And he invited me for lunch with his family. And we ate lunch together. We have remained friends until now. When he doesn't see me for a while, he will ask me where I am. You know? If, if I was to go, if in my heart I had planned to go anywhere else, I could not. Because in this church, on my first day, I had already made a friend. Brethren who come to church wants to be friends. Let us befriend one another. There are visitors who frequent our services every day. Do we know them? Do we encourage them to bring their membership? You know, it is not just the work of the church clerk and the elders. It is our work. I remember one time uh, one of our pastors asked, you know, when we talk about ministry, reaching out to others, and bringing more sheep. He asked us as a church. He is the shepherd. Because he is the one who shepherds the church. Of course Christ is the main shepherd. But he is now the co-shepherd. And we are the flock. Between the flock and the shepherd. Ninani Anaza. 
You know, if you have a flock of sheep and you are the shepherd, who gives birth to sheep? Is it the shepherd or the sheep? It is the same with the church. It is not the work of the pastor to bring more members, to ask members to bring in their membership. We, the flock, must reach out to each flock and make sure that the flock that is sitting next to you in church is a member. And if they are not members, ask and assist them to bring their membership. It is also the same that it is us who are to go out and bring others also to church. To reach out to those who have not heard and be involved in works of fellowship. When you come to church, when you come to church, sit in front. Sit in front. You know, most of us, when we come to church, we like sitting at the back. Even when the church is empty, you will come and sit at the back. I would like to let you know that you should sit in the front. When majority of those who are singing are behind you, when majority of those who are singing are behind you, you hear more message of the song that you are singing than when you are behind everyone who is singing. When you are behind everyone who is singing, you are straining to hear the chorister lead. When you are in front, you hear the chorister and you hear the chorus from the congregation and you are able to internalize the message. When you are in front, volume of the music is directed towards you. When you are at the back, the volume of the music is in front of you and you are not getting it. But there is something else about sitting in front. At front of the church there is normally very little disruptions during the service. When you sit at the back you see everyone who moves out, you escort them to the door and when you are escorting them with your eyes to the door the sermon or the singing is going on. Another one comes in to pick them up from the door to usher them until they sit. Your attention is focused on that moment. Sometimes it is the baby crying. You are not only distracted by the cry of the baby, but you also feel disgusted and discomfort at the baby crying during the service. And while you are escorting the baby and the mother to the door, the service has not stopped. And you will find that you lost the gist. And so I would like to encourage that when you come in and there is open space before you, take the front seat. Let me finish by saying we have been invited to worship the Lord with singing and gladness. And so when you see the church sing like you mean it, sing like you experience the song, sing like you are opening your heart and When people about the love of Christ and inviting them to come back to the Savior and be saved. Time will not allow me. So let me conclude by making these four statements. Number one, 
Worshiping the Lord with gladness is not just a suggestion. It is a commandment from the Lord. God commands us. You know, every promise that the Lord gives us, every calling that we read in the scripture is a command. So when we read from Psalms 100, verse 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, David says, come and worship the Lord, enter into his gates. It is a command. He's asking us to come that we may worship the Lord with gladness. Why? Because the Lord is good. The Lord created us. The Lord is merciful and is loving. Number two, as we worship God with gladness, we will experience the joy and peace that comes from knowing him. When we worship the Lord with an open heart, when we open our hearts and worship the Lord with joy and gladness, the mountains in our lives will melt away. You know, the children of Israel captured the city of Jericho by music and prayer. Worshiping the Lord opened the Red Sea for the Israelites to pass on dry land. It opened Jordan. Worshiping the Lord in joy and gladness stopped the sun from moving so that Joshua could finish the battle. When we worship the Lord with gladness, we will experience joy and peace that comes from only knowing Christ. This week, Pastor Gidinji was sharing with us the experience of the Christian and the experience of the non-Christian. And you know, most of the time we say that the life of a Christian is a miserable life. It's a difficult life. And the question that she, he was asking through the, the pen of inspiration that uh, he was referring us to is asking, don't the sinners feel sick the same way Christians feel? Do the sinners die the same way Christians die? Do the sinners lose property the same way Christians do? What then is the difference? The sinners, the non-believers would lose and they would say, I have lost everything. They would lose a child and they said, this child meant everything for me. He was all the world. He was the supplier, the breadwinner. You know? He would lose business and they would say, this deal has sunk me down. But the Christian would say in all these things like Job, I came naked out of my mother. I will return naked. Glory and honor to be his name. We live suffering but we have a hope we know that even when we sleep in this sleep of death there is hope of another life as opposed to the non-believers whose life ends when they end when we worship the Lord in gladness we experience the joy and peace that comes from knowing him joy and peace that only us can have number three Worshipping the Lord with gladness deepens our relationship with God and gives us a new perspective to life. I think uh, what I have shared in point number two also covers this, that a Christian has got hope beyond the physical things that we see in this world. We have hope in a God who lives forever. And finally, and this is my prayer, brethren, that we may make it our daily habit to worship the Lord with gladness. Why? Because the Lord is worthy of our praise and our adoration. There is no better person to worship, to adore, to revere than our God. And so, as the Nairobi East Choral invites you this week that we may share in this theme of serving the Lord with joy and gladness. May this be our experience at home and when we come to church, let us share this experience coming ready to serve one another and not just to be served. May this be your experience. May this be my experience in Jesus' name. Shall we pray? We thank you, Heavenly Father, for your word gives us strength. You want us to have an experience with you. And so you invite us to start this experience from the place of worship and prayer. And you invite us that while we are reverent, 
Reverence does not take away joy from us. Because when your spirit lives in us, the fruit of the spirit that we share as Christians is the fruit of joy. Being joyful, being glad as we live and as we worship you in itself is a testimony to non-believers that we have someone special in our lives. And so, in calling us to worship you in joy and gladness, you are actually calling us to come before you and surrender totally to you. And this is our prayer this evening, that you may enable each one of us to have the experience of total surrender to you, so that we may have the privilege of worshiping you with joy and gladness. And when you come back the second time, we may continue with this joy as we sing the song of Moses and the Lamb, the song of our salvation, when we will settle before you just to remember with a smile how far you have been in us. And Lord, we thank you because through all our experience this evening, I know each one of us has a different experience, but in all these experiences, you are still God, worthy of our praise worthy of our adoration, worthy of our reverence, worthy of our service, worthy of our songs of praise and worship. And I pray that through it all, through it all, dear Lord, we may worship you with joy and gladness. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let me welcome you to Friday Vespers as Sister Dorcas comes to give us uh, some few lines of music that uh, we will be meeting again with another speaker as we look at this theme of worshiping the Lord in joy and gladness, climaxing in our music Sabbath. Come one, come all. We are all invited to worship the Lord in joy and in gladness at the Nairobi East Seventh-day Adventist Church. May God bless you. Um, that was powerful. We will do one hymn to close uh, before Elder Gordon prays to disperse us. Hymn number 246, Worthy, Worthy is the Lamb. That, of course, is the theme throughout this week. Let's sing together. Worthy, worthy is the Lamb. Worthy, worthy is the Lamb. Worthy, worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Glory, hallelujah. Praise Him, hallelujah. Glory, hallelujah, to the Lamb. Savior, let thy kingdom come. Now the power of sin consume. Bring thy blessed millennium. Holy Lamb, glory. Hallelujah, praise him, hallelujah, glory, hallelujah, to the Lamb. Thus may we each moment feel, love him, serve him, praise him still, till we Amen. So we will share the grace and then we will disperse. Let's say the grace. And now, may the grace, the grace of our Lord, Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ, the love of, of, love of God, 
and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. May God bless you.